So yeah, I saw them come to the run round. Um, actually, I usually work in middle of the night, so I'm not good at morning, but I should come more often because I found that there's a free breakfast. So, so uh, yeah, I wrote this proposal uh, during the transition period from Cleveland Clinic to the Stanford. And uh, fortunately, I got the support from departments. I really appreciate the support from departments. Uh, today, I would like to talk about my uh, research update. But actually, I will talk about what I'm what I am struggling with. But before talking about that, I would like to talk about my presentation. So before coming to the United States, as Dr. Martinez said, uh, I was in Japan and uh, I work as a HPV surgeon. And uh, after I came to the United States, I did a transplant fellowship and I became a transplant surgeon. So because of those backgrounds, uh, my research interest is in uh, liver transplant oncology. As you know, uh, this topic is now, it's a hot topic in transplant field. So now uh, liver transplants can be applied to the many primary and the secondary cancer, such as HCC. And even now we can apply the liver transplant for the colorectal liver metastasis. Today, I would like to talk about uh, focus on the uh, liver transplant for HCC. Liver transplant is the best uh, treatment option for the HCC patient because we can remove tumor together with background uh, cirrhotical liver. So theoretically, we can remove whole tumor and they also the background culture genetical liver. So after transplants, ideally, supposed to, uh, there is no reclaims, but still 10 to 20% patients recur after transplant. So why recurrence happen? There's a two reason. The first one is a simple. Uh, tumor had already uh, been existed at the time of a transplant and just we couldn't find it. So this one, we cannot uh, prevent uh, recurrence by transplant. Only we can do is uh, make better selection criteria or better uh, imaging modality or careful selection. The second one is uh, circulating cancer cell, uh, which loads into the tissue and settle down and grow up uh, under immunosuppression environment. This is a target to treat. So in liver transplant, uh, and uh, there's a one big difference between liver resection for malignancy and the liver transplant for malignancy. In, for example, uh, liver trans uh, resection for corrector meds, usually after surgery, we give adjuvant chemotherapy if tumor is advanced. But in transplants, after surgery, we give immunosuppression. This is completely opposite. Uh, with adjuvant chemotherapy. So we are doing liver transplant for HCC more than 30 years. This is a standard treatment, but we don't have any standard immunosuppression protocol, special protocol for HCC patient. And uh, we are doing treated those patients basically the same as non-HCC patient. The other difference is we don't have any adjuvant therapy in liver transplant for HCC because HCC is uh, chemo resistance in nature. So those two uh, lack of uh, standard protocol, uh, immunosuppression protocol, and the lack of adjuvant therapy is a met need in transplant oncology field. The calcineurin inhibitor, such as tacrolimus or cyclosporine, uh, which is still main drug uh, after liver, uh, main immunosuppression drug after liver transplant. So surprisingly, there are only few publications uh, regarding the uh, immunosuppression inference in liver transplant for HCC. This is a, a biggest paper so far, uh, published in 2013 in Journal of Hepatology. And the UK group found that if patients expose a, a higher uh, calcium inhibitor uh, level in the first one month, the patient had a uh, worse outcome. This is pretty simple. And actually everybody knows that. So it's just to show that. And oh, they 
put the label wrong. So this one is a high exposure and the high exposure patient had a worse outcome. So this very simple publication goes to the, such a high impact journal. So it means uh, this field is not well explored, I investigated. So after I read this paper, I had a, one question, why first one month? So if first one month affects outcome so strongly, so if the patient had a much stronger immunosuppression for first three months or six months, probably patient had a much worse outcome. So I investigate, uh, I collected the data back in Cleveland and I checked, uh, checked whether three months or six months affect more significantly or not. And uh, I couldn't find significant results. The first month, three months, six months didn't uh, have any difference. So I almost closed that study, but before I closed that study, I went to the different direction. I checked the first one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and I found that uh, immunosuppression rebels uh, in the first one week or two weeks had a much significant uh, inference to the cancer recurrence. This is the ROC analysis, and you can see the uh, AUC was around uh, seven, uh, 0 0.7. And I called uh, my friends and they asked them to give me a data. And uh, I found that uh, another institute like Indiana, MGH, and Rochester, those all institutes had the same uh, result. So this was uh, this result was consistent in four institutes. And then if I divided uh, immunosuppression level first in two weeks, three group, low, uh, medium, and high level, you can see uh, outcome uh, significantly different. So if we can keep the immunosuppression in the first two weeks, low level, uh, the, around the seven years outcome is around five to 7%. And if it's if we keep immunosuppression high, it's three times higher recurrence rate. And a very interesting result was this. If we can keep immunosuppression low in the first two weeks, even we give a high dose of immunosuppression in the next two weeks, the recurrence curve didn't change with uh, keep low side. And if we keep, uh, if we give gave a high immunosuppression level in the first two weeks. Even we give low dose of immunosuppression next two weeks, the outcome didn't change. So it means uh, first two weeks uh, of immunosuppression is pretty important. It means if we can reduce uh, exposure to the immunosuppression in the first two weeks, probably we can reduce uh, HCC recalance. So, in this context, uh, the best way to reduce immuno, uh, the recurrence, HCC recurrence, is immunotolerance. However, so far, uh, most of the immunotolerance protocol, uh, including the Stanford protocol, uh, those immunotolerance protocol give stronger immunosuppression in the first few weeks. So it's going to the different direction. So second best one is immunomoderation plus uh, decreasing immunosuppression. I mean, immunomodulation is not only suppression. Moderation means uh, not suppress, but makes immune system calm down. So I look for the something which can do the immunomoderation, and I found uh, mesenchymal stem cell. Mesenchymal stem cell is multipotent uh, stem cell, which can differentiate to the bone or uh, adipose tissue or like a connective tissue. The interesting character of the mesenchymal stem cell is uh, which can suppress T cell proliferation and the cytokine secretion. So it's kind of like a decrease uh, immune, kind of like immune activity, but at the same time, it's not decrease or immunosuppress, just make it calm down. Actually, uh, the very, how to say, detail of the MSC how it work is still not clear. But uh, MSC is already used in many clinical settings, like a Crohn disease and the GVHD after bone marrow transplant. And recently uh, people started using for the uh, 
the complication of uh, COVID, long-term complication of COVID. And uh, so far, I know uh, there's two commercialized company uh, which can provide uh, MSC. Oh, sorry, this is something wrong. So how about in transplant field? Uh, there's one paper published in 2012. Uh, Italian and Chinese uh, collaboration group published in JAMA. Uh, JAMA. So they use uh, MSC in kidney transplant. So this one, Capra Meyer Cobb, the outcome is infection complication. So this is a standard treatment group. They use uh, anti IL2 receptor antibody for induction therapy. And uh, if they use uh, MSC instead of uh, Simulect, uh, the infection complications significantly decrease. So furthermore, if they decrease immunosup uh, calcinin inhibitor, uh, their outcome got much better. Then uh, we, they checked the rejection rate as well. And they found that there is no increase in rejection rate. So it means uh, MSC can reduce uh, infection complication uh, without increasing rejection. That means uh, MSC can make the immune system calm down, but not suppress. And this is uh, another study from Italian group. They use MSC for liver transplant. <coughs> Sorry. And they didn't find very significant graft survival difference or something, but they found that uh, Mild positive change means uh, increased regulatory T cell and regulatory NK cell. It means MSC work for uh, calm down immune system. So I thought to decrease uh, HCC recurrence, why don't you use MSC for induction therapy, like a, a kidney transplant study? So I uh, conducted a study, and uh, this is uh, my proposal just to uh, use MSC for induction for five patients. Sorry, something. So this is a uh, Stanford immunosuppression protocol. Our protocol is pretty simple. We give a uh, corticosteroid uh, between the hepatectomy and the implantation. And we give the cymoglobin uh, with corticosteroid three doses uh, in ICU. And also we started tacrolimus uh, immediately after uh, transplant. And we will keep the immunosuppression level around 10. The, instead of that, uh, my protocol is try to use, uh, replace cymoglobin into the two doses of uh, MSC. And also try to decrease tacrolimus level around the seven. And the outcome measurement is adverse events and the biopsy proven acute rejection within one month. And I negotiate uh, this company, Osim Health, uh, which locates in San Francisco. And they promised me to provide uh, their product uh, for two doses by $7,000. And this is, they said, 50% um, say bargain discount, but uh, I do not believe so. But. And also, uh, this is a case number of uh, liver transplant for HCC in, uh, at Stanford. We have enough case number of HCC patients to finish this study. And we, last year, we did a 125 liver transplant. And this year, probably we reached 130. So we have enough case, case volume. So I thought I can do this study very easily. But things is not so easy. So far, unfortunately, uh, I couldn't do any of the case. I'm struggling with uh, go through regulatory process. So from this, from this point, I just talk about excuse. Sorry, don't throw me the stones. <laughs> uh, I started to do some regulatory process uh, from March, 2022. And first, I ask the uh, help to the Center for Def Definitive 
creative medicine, and they asked me to submit an uh, intake form. And I waited three months, and they declined. The decline reason is your study is too small. Okay, if I have a million dollar research funds, why I have to ask you guys to help? Because my study is small, that's why I help, ask help, but they declined. Meanwhile, uh, I did uh, ICO intake because Austin didn't have any contract with Stanford, but this was nicely approved in August. Then August, I approached the regulatory affair manager. Uh, he was his very good guy and uh, he helped us a lot. Then he proposed us to uh, submit the intake to the CCTO, Cancer Clinical Trial Office. Then I contact them and they ask me to write and I wrote IND. Actually, I completed. And uh, because uh, the company helped me and I also wrote uh, most of them. Then, but the, I have no experience of writing IND. So I need to kind of like, uh, I didn't know the wording or what's required. So I asked them to help to finish up. Then uh, after two months, they asked me to submit it to the GI Cancer Regulatory Group, Research Group, sorry, CLZ. And uh, because they asked us to submit it there because they cannot help us unless they approve the protocol. Okay, so I submitted to the GICLZ. Then GICLZ declined because they said they supposed to discuss about the research, which is uh, kind of like a finished IND uh, submission and the ILB submission. So like a, which one first, chicken or egg? So I stuck. And then, actually, I didn't write there. But um, after this, I Google and uh, find one company which can help regulatory process. And then I submitted. And they didn't reply for one month. And I found that they closed their business. <laughs> so everything going to the wrong direction. Actually, presenting this thing is very awkward for me. But actually, I need the help. And that's why I present this thing instead of escaping. And then we have still some time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Instead of this uh, study, I'm doing another study. Uh, as I said, there's a two unmet needs. Another unmet needs is adjuvant setup. As I mentioned, HCC is basically chemo resistant. And uh, currently, many people think immunotherapy is great, but uh, we cannot use immunotherapy for transplant patients because once we use immunotherapy for transplant patients, they have severe rejection, patients die. And uh, many people believe mTOR has a good uh, anti-cancer uh, effect, but uh, so far, it's controversial. So far, uh, we only have uh, at this moment, the best option is adoptive immunotherapy. So I look for the something adoptive immunotherapy usable in liver transplant for HCC. And the, I found that uh, there is a one immunotherapy done in Japan and also the United States. Uh, this, is, this protocol is originally done in Hiroshima University and they, they brought to the United States and this phase one tryout was done in the University of Miami. It's pretty simple protocol. They use a donor derived uh, liver NK cell. As you know, NK cell is natural killer cell. They will kill the cancer without any education. And they found the Hiroshima University team found NK cell inside the liver is much more specific and uh, higher, has higher cytotoxicity against HCCs and peripheral blood NK cell. So this protocol is pretty simple, just perfuse donor liver and the collect perfusate and then collect in liver NK cell and activate using IL-2 and incubate uh, for three days, then give it back to the patient. 
This is a, a outcome uh, from Hiroshima University. So um, significant result is this one. Uh, even patient has outside Milan criteria, it means advanced ATC. If they give the NK cell, there's a significant difference. So this is uh, very attractive for me. And the, I get a second. This one is uh, results from Miami University. They did uh, 18 cases, and the one case they uh, diagnosed, misdiagnosed uh, as HCC, uh, sarcoma as HCC. So if we uh, exclude this patient, they did a 17 patient, and a none of the patient died because of a cancer. So actually, this treatment is very pretty promising. So I'm working on this project and try to submit uh, NIH grant soon and also try to do the uh, making <coughs> uh, NK cell bank because the NK cell function is different uh, by individual donors. So some of the patients, uh, even uh, young patients has a low uh, NK cell function. Some of the patient who had who is older, but sometimes those patients has a high NK cell function. So we are trying to find a predictor of the uh, NK cell function. And also we would like to make the off the shelf NK cell therapy. Usually if we frozen NK cell therapy to store that uh, function goes down, but we found that if we give IL-37, uh, we can make the revive the NK cell. So we are training those kind of thing and to make an adjuvant cell. Thank you.